Hi, I'm Terry Tomlin. In this series, we take a journey inside the Florida Aquarium to join wildlife experts, educators, and students just like you on a mission to entertain and educate while inspiring stewardship for the natural environment. Together, using science and research, we'll increase our knowledge and expose some myths by venturing inside the fascinating world of sharks, sea turtles, oysters, fishes of the wetlands, and marine mammals. These species all help inspire us to protect and conserve the world's priceless marine animals and their environments. So let's take the plunge on a learning adventure that explores these amazing wonders of our undersea world. This is the Florida Aquarium's Tanks to the Ocean, an educational web series brought to you by the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation. Sea turtles are elusive and majestic creatures that have glided through the ocean for thousands of years. From the time hatchlings leave the beach until females return as adults to nest and lay eggs, scientists have limited knowledge of how these mysterious and captivating creatures live. In this episode, we'll journey along through the life of sea turtles and discover the many challenges and obstacles these animals encounter. We'll also learn the many ways we can improve the ocean ecosystem for the future of sea turtles and other marine creatures. My name is Susan. I'm the veterinary technician and sea turtle stranding coordinator here at the Florida Aquarium. During this episode, we're going to show you two sea turtles that did come into rehab. And by the end, we're hoping you can maybe get a clue on why they came in. We have Tater, who is a juvenile green sea turtle, and Pistachio, who is a juvenile Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. Some of the reasons juvenile sea turtles might come into a rehab situation is because they were maybe caught on hook and line by a fisherman and have a foreign body in them. Or they could have ingested a foreign body like a plastic bag out in the wild. They could also become entangled in monofilament, which is fishing line. They may also be affected by the cold weather, which is a cold sun situation. Just like you and I can be affected by the cold, so can they. And the other reason could be that they were maybe struck by a boat. Did you know that out of all seven species of sea turtles, the flatback sea turtle hustling is the largest? Flatback sea turtles are native to Australia. Hi everybody, my name's Jay Flint. I'm an intern here at the Florida Aquarium doing research on marine turtles. There's seven known species to occur worldwide and they occur in all oceans of the world with the exception of the polar regions. Marine turtles are reptiles, which means that they are cold-blooded, they breathe air, they, so they have lungs that need to come to the surface of the water to breathe. And they also have scales. Marine turtles also lay eggs once they reach adulthood, which is about 30 years old. When it comes time for a female to lay her eggs, she hauls herself up onto the beach and chooses a site that she likes. She then starts digging an egg chamber. The egg chambers are about six to eight inches wide at the top, so about this wide. She then digs it in the shape of a light bulb, so it's sort of skinny at the top and bowls out at the bottom. Once the, the female's happy with the depth of that hole, she then starts laying her eggs one at a time. Depending on the species, depends on how many eggs they lay. So they could lay between 50 or 200 eggs. If you see a nesting turtle, you may see what looks like tears coming out of her eyes while she's laying her eggs. This is actually her salt glands in her eyes, excreting the salt out of her system. It happens while they're in the ocean as well, it's just that because they're swimming, you can't see it. Once she's laid all the eggs, she then fills in that egg chamber and returns the beach to its natural depth. This allows the eggs to incubate at a natural temperature. The sand temperature determines the sex of the eggs and also determines how long the eggs will incubate in the sand for. Incubation is about two months. From the time that the female e exits the water, hauls herself up onto the beach, digs her egg chamber, lays her eggs, fills it all in and goes back to the water, is about 60 minutes. She comes back to lay every about two weeks or so, and she'll go through that whole process again. She normally does this five to eight times a season. Again, just depending on the species. What they found through research is that female turtles will return to the same region that they are born. This could be within one mile of the area or about 100 miles of the area. Peak nesting of marine turtles occurs 
during the summer months. So that's when people are most likely to be all holidaying on the beach. So it's really important that you take in your beach furniture, your beach umbrellas and your beach toys at night. These are hazards for both hatchlings and nesting turtles and may cause the nesting turtles to turn around and not lay their eggs there that night. If you are walking the beaches here at night and you do come across a, a sea turtle, remember don't use your torches or flashlights as they're known here in America on the beach as this can disorientate the, the female turtle or the hatchlings. Another human impact of marine turtles is beach tree nourishment. Beach tree nourishment is where sand is brought into the beach and used to return the beach to a higher level than what it was at. This process can affect both nesting turtles and the hatchlings. So the nesting turtles may find the sand too hard or not of the right consistency and they won't lay their eggs so they'll return to the water. Did you know that thousands of female Ridley sea turtles come ashore at the same time to nest? These large groups are called air bombs, which is Spanish for arrival. We're behind the scenes here at the Florida Aquarium and we're gonna talk about how turtles go from eggs this size, these are ping pong balls, to adult turtles this size. Once they've incubated, the hatchlings then use their egg tooth, like birds, to break out of the shell. They all break out together and then they start to dig. They all dig as a group and they have to dig as a group. If they don't, they may get left behind in the nest. Because they're digging at night when the sand is cold, they're actually emerging out of their nest at night time and running down the beach at night. This is one of the ways they avoid their predators, such as birds and crabs, which aren't, aren't as active on the beach at night time. As the hatchlings come out of the sand, they're orientating themselves towards the lowest, lightest point, which in a natural environment is the horizon. And in some of the built up areas, where there's houses and condominiums along the beach, that horizon is altered. And this can threaten the survival of sea turtles because instead of going to the water, they turn around and head inland. And this causes them to get lost. Only 65 to 70% of hatchlings actually make it to the water. And then once they do, they have other predators that they need to watch for, such as big fish, including sharks. Once they're out in the water, they start swimming for a couple of days non-stop out to the sargassum weed that's floating in the water and that's where they stay. For how long, we don't know. This is where it turns into the lost years. One of the thought processes at the moment about survivorship is that one in a thousand will make it through to sexual maturity. That's one in a thousand eggs, making it through to an adult this size. Did you know young sea turtles may spend as long as a decade in the open ocean before returning to coastal waters to grow and mature? We are behind the scenes right now with T-Rex. T-Rex is one of our juvenile green sea turtles that was picked up on the east coast of Florida by some fishermen. He was floating underneath a bridge. When he was picked up, they noticed that he was missing both front flippers, which we believe was due to monofilament, which is fishing line, entangled around both front flippers. Juvenile green sea turtles mainly feed in mangrove areas and seagrass beds. Other sea turtle species will be found in these areas as well, eating invertebrates such as crabs and shrimp. And the reason why sea turtles come into rehab, sometimes we just don't know. And if that is the case, then we have lots of equipment that can help us try to determine that. We're able to do blood work to find out what their white cells and their red blood cells look like. We're able to also do x-rays to look for those, some of those foreign bodies to see if there's any issues going on internally. Sometimes we may still not know what's going on with this animal and we may partner with a specialty clinic or even a human hospital to help us determine what's going on with that animal. The sea turtle's top shell is called the carapace and on the carapace they have their vertebra which is their backbone that runs in it. Their lungs are also attached so they're unable to survive without this. On top of the carapace they have scoots that also protect them. The scoots are scales and all reptiles have them. And as they grow, they will shed these scoots off. Sea turtles are the only turtle species that are unable to retract all the way into their shell to protect themselves like other species can. The juvenile size class of sea turtles is about the size of a dinner plate or a serving platter or maybe even your cafeteria lunch tray. They're not real big, 
Each species will vary in their size, even as adults. The leatherback sea turtle can get up to seven feet long, so when they're a juvenile, they may be a little bit bigger than other turtles. Florida has six of the seven sea turtle species in our waters. Only five of those species do nest on our beaches. Loggerheads, which occupy 90% of the nesting population in the U.S., green sea turtles, leatherbacks, and then the occasional Kemp's Ridley and Hawksville will also nest on those beaches. Did you know that the temperature of the sand determines the number of male and female sea turtles? Warmer temperatures produce more females and cooler temperatures produce more males. That means there's going to be hot chicks and cool dudes. Hi, I'm Kathy. I'm the veterinarian here at the Florida Aquarium, and I'm going to share some information with you about adult green sea turtles. Um, adult green sea turtles are typically uh, seagrass foragers. That's what they tend to eat. So during the day, they will be found in seagrass beds. In the evening hours, they tend to live more in a habitat like that behind me, which is a coral reef setting. So they'll find a rock or a cave or something to hide in, so they're um, safe from predators, and then they, they spend their evenings there and then move back to the seagrass beds during the daytime. As far as how old green sea turtles live, um, no one's actually really sure. The oldest one that's been known to be in an aquarium was actually over 60 years old. The adult diet uh, for these sea turtles vary by species. So loggerheads and ridleys typically are eating on invertebrates and crustaceans, whereas uh, leatherbacks would be feeding on jellyfish. Um, green sea turtles, as we already mentioned, are primarily herbivores, so they're eating on sea grasses. And then hawksbills actually eat sponges, and they're the only sea turtle that are actually capable of eating sponges. Um, in a rehab setting, we try to mimic their diets as best as we can um, with the food items that we have available. So obviously we're not um, growing algae or sea grasses here at the aquarium, but we can supplement them with other very healthy leafy greens such as romaine and kale. Um, and then for protein sources, we're using things such as uh, fish like mackerel, herring, capelin, um, squid, and uh, shrimp would be some of the invertebrates that we feed out as well. And then for all of our rehab turtles before they're actually released, we actually do live food test them. So um, we'll give them things like blue crabs and crayfish to make sure that they're able to actually forage on their own and capture their own prey so when they get back out um, into their natural environment they're able to do that. Adult turtles do come into the rehab setting from time to time very similar to juveniles and for some of the very same reasons. Um, so um, potentially ingesting a foreign body, being caught by a fisherman, being struck by a boat, um, or cold stress is another big one. Um, we do the same things that we do with juvenile turtles. So each turtle is, its, is an individual case. So when that animal comes in, we're doing everything we can, blood work, x-rays, anything we can to figure out why it came into rehab and to correct whatever problem it has. And then the ideal situation for each of these turtles is that they get released back to their natural environment after they come through rehab. When they do get released, we take every uh, possible chance that we get to be able to track them afterwards. So um, what we do is we flip or tag each turtle that leaves rehab. So they get a metal uh, band, a marker on each of their flippers. And then they also get pit tagged, which is um, sort of an electronic um, a device and insert that we put into the turtle slipper that it can be scanned as a barcode um, if that turtle should ever come back to shore again or be in a rehab setting again. Um, ideally, the best information that we can get is by satellite tagging these turtles, and that's just not something that's cost effective to do with every rehab turtle. Um, but those that we are able to do, um, it gives you lots of information about where they go when they leave rehab and, and where they spend the majority of their time. We did actually satellite tag a Kemp's Ridley turtle that came through rehab here recently. His name was Tampa Red, and that turtle was tracked for several months after it left rehab and, and gave us lots of valuable information about where that turtle went and what it was doing. Green sea turtles, um, adult green sea turtles spend the majority of their time in these foraging type habitats, but every year to every other year, um, both the males and the females will move more into the inshore area, and that's for mating and for nesting. So the males will stay offshore, and they're mating with females, and then the females, when they're ready, will come to the beaches and will nest up to six to eight times in that year, and that's usually every two weeks, every 10 to 14 days they'll do that nesting. Um, once they're finished, they will both then move back out to the offshore foraging areas that they're typically accustomed to and where they live out most of their lives. And they, those areas can be hundreds of miles away from where they actually nest. Did you know that you cannot determine whether a sea turtle is male or female until the sea turtle reaches an adult size? Adult male sea turtles have much longer and thicker tails than adult female sea turtles. 
Hi, my name is Tristan and I'm joining you from the Education Department here at the Florida Aquarium. Thank you so much for joining us as we explore the life of sea turtles. Now, I want to take a few minutes to review those turtles we met at the beginning. We met Pistachio and Tater. Now, Pistachio had a couple of not so pleasant injuries on his head and also his carapace or the top of his shell. Now, as we've learned, you might be thinking that those injuries came from possibly a boat strike. And you are exactly right. Unfortunately, Pistachio was hit by a boat and was brought here to the Florida Aquarium to be rehabilitated. Now, we saw Pistachio earlier in our episode and you can tell that his injuries have healed really, really nicely. Now, the next step for Pistachio before he's able to be released is undergoing a few tests. One of the tests that he will take is about catching live food. So we'll make, put some crabs or crayfish in his tank to see if he's actually able to catch those. Depending on how that goes, he could be released in the near future. Now, Tater, our other turtle that we saw earlier, when he came in, he had lost a lot of weight, which is considered to be emaciated and he was covered in barnacles. So our vet and our vet tech, who you met earlier, took the time to remove all those barnacles. We also put Tater on a pretty healthy diet, but we discovered when he was here that he also had a blood infection. And because of that, they've decided to do a blood transfusion. Now Flip, our green sea turtle that lives in the reef behind me, was chosen to be the blood donor. So Flip donated blood, they transfused that into Tater, and that helped Tater make his full recovery, which eventually led to his release in February of 2014. So you're probably wondering, why does all of this matter? If you remember earlier in our episode, we saw long line hooks, fishing line, as well as plastic bags that had all come into contact with turtles at one time or another. So I have a little example for you guys to try. If you simply take a rubber band and pretend like your hand is a sea turtle, your front flipper could be your thumb and your pinky, you're gonna take that rubber band and wrap it around those two fingers. Now pretend that this represents fishing line or monofilament, and if a turtle gets entangled, how easy is it for them to untangle themselves or get unwrapped? So see if you can get the rubber band off your hand without using your other hand, you'll notice that it is extremely difficult to get untangled. Another example that we saw earlier were how plastic bags affect sea turtles. So here I have just a piece of a regular grocery bag, but I want you to think about what it looks like when it's in the water. So if I sink it over here, you'll notice that it might resemble something like a jellyfish. Well, jellyfish are popular food items for this sea turtle right here, the leatherback. Now, if they were to accidentally eat a plastic bag, as we learned earlier, that could stop them up internally, causing them to not be able to survive. So what can you do to help? Well, given that here in Florida, we all live really, really close to the ocean, there are easy things that you can do, some of which you might already be doing, like recycling. But I think it's important to make sure that you are also disposing of all of your trash in an appropriate way. And that way it won't affect creatures like our sea turtles and other animals living out there in the ocean. Other important things that you can do are educate others. Spread the word, tell your friends and family what they can do to help as well. Every little bit does matter. Thank you for joining us today on our exploration of the fascinating world of sea turtles. We look forward to seeing you here at the Florida Aquarium. This series is presented by the Florida Aquarium with generous support from the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation. We thank you for watching. For more information or to donate, please visit us in downtown Tampa or online.